and chaitanya open it to the participants also who registered sure sir sure sir it's a allowing sir it's okay. a started sir okay <clears throat> So shall I start, sir? Yes, Dr. Jaram. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening to all the participants in the webinar and greetings from the Institute of the Hyderabad. At the outside, at the outside, I thank Prof. Nathan Grill for accepting to be the guest, to, be, to give his lecture uh, today, today, today. So I thank him a lot and he is very much in time, even in time. I say a few words about the Professor, uh, Professor Nathan Gill. Professor Nathan Gill. Uh, Professor Nathan Gill's involvement in global health spans 20 years. He began his tertiary studies through the Australian Defence Force Academy before transferring to Monash University to complete his medical studies. He obtained a MPH and a DPhil public health from Oxford University under a Rhodes Scholarship and is a fellow of the UK and Australian faculties of public health. He joined the Nostal Institute in 2008. In 2014, Nathan completed a professional directorate in public health at Monash University using social network analysis to measure the impact of public health partnerships. He is involved in public health training, research, and advocacy. Nathan's research exercise is in the areas of non-communicable diseases, disability inclusion, community health evaluation, monitoring, primary health care systems, and understanding faith-based development agencies and programs. Dr. Nathan has worked extensively in India, including leading a tobacco control research collaboration to develop tobacco control interventions. In the disability field in India, he led the implementation of the RAD disability measurement tool. He has developed partnerships with the leading Indian institutions, such as Public Health Foundation of India, CMC Vellore, Catholic Health Association of India, and EHA. Nathan has worked in international health and development in Africa, Fiji, East Timor, PNG, Bangladesh, and Nepal. He has supervised more than 40 students and volunteers through his research programs and established five health and development focused NGOs. He has served on the board of four health charities. He currently focuses on India, where he works on disability, primary health care systems, and non communicable diseases. So I, I thank Dr. Nathan for such a vast experience to deliver his lecture and today's webinar. Now I request our director, Professor GVS Muthi. Uh, to say a few words about the institute and other things. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jairam. Uh, thank you, Nathan. It's always a pleasure to meet you because you're a person who's ever smiling and uh, spread positive vibrations uh, across uh, the uh, place wherever you are located. So it, it was a pleasure first knowing you, I think, when you met uh, for the first time in Bangalore and then of course we met uh, in Hyderabad uh, after that. So thank you for agreeing to uh, speak to the, uh, the audience today. Uh, just for uh, your information, Nathan, this is a, a public health series, a public health lecture series, oh, which we actually do uh, once a month. So this is the third in that order um, of having the uh, guest lectures. Uh, the first one was in relation to COVID and we had uh, Dr. David Heyman and uh, Dr. Giri, a colleague from Bengaluru who's done some fantastic work on modeling as well as in uh, looking at the magnitude and prevention of COVID. The second series was on early childhood development and looking at uh, inclusion as an important aspect. And that was delivered by Dr. Sananda Reddy. And this is the third in the series, Anitin. And 
for uh, the entire group who's listening in, if you look at these three, what the three in that series actually denote is the need for first understanding what COVID has done in the world, how it has impacted us. The second one was looking at activities which cannot be stopped, COVID or no COVID. So there are things, whether it is the NCD clinics, whether it is the screening for ROP or activities for early childhood development, they will not wait for COVID. If you wait for COVID in providing those services, then you are going to have another generation in the post-COVID era who have suffered because the care was not provided. And therefore, the third thing that we have today is to look at how systems are being managed in the post-COVID scenario and looking at the examples from Australia to India, looking at a cross comparison, and then trying to understand what can be done within the Indian context, learning from experiences, how other countries have delivered. Everybody has suffered from COVID. Australia was, being an island was uh, safe in the beginning, but then they again had uh, an outbreak not of the uh, same magnitude as India, but it was in comparison to Australian standards, a big outbreak. And how they actually fought that and are still fighting in terms of the sort of restrictions that you have in Australia is very different to what we currently see in India. And therefore, this is gonna be a fascinating exposition of how things are different and what health systems can actually learn from each other to stay afloat and remain vibrant, responding to the people's needs, COVID or no COVID, to make a difference to the lives of people. Thank you very much for joining the session. The floor is now yours, Nathan. We'd all love to hear you speak. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, uh, Dr. DBS and uh, Dr. JRM as well. It's a real pleasure to be able to join you at PHFI. I wish I could be there in person. Uh, that's not possible right now. We aren't allowed to travel in Australia. But the background that you'll see behind me is uh, from North India, actually from my house in North India, a beautiful view. So I will enjoy it at least uh, virtually. But uh, GVS, look, uh, that, that uh, introduction is really helpful. It reflects a lot of what I'm going to touch on as well. And um, I think we're all on the same page there of learning from each other. Um, but just to say, we've had a long association with the uh, IOPH and with PHFI uh, and a long association with yourself and your team, GVS. And we've enjoyed working and learning from you over the last, um, it must be nearly eight or nine years now, we've collaborated on different projects. So we're hoping that can continue in the future. And so it's a pleasure to be able to speak uh, to your students and to your wider community that um, PHFI links in. And I hope I can give some insights. I feel unqualified to be able to comment on some of these things compared to your last speakers. Uh, but I can bring an Australian view, which maybe I'm qualified to bring that in. So with that, I'll start uh, my presentation. I'll share my screen. And please let me know if um, I'm going too fast or if my Australian accent is too difficult to understand, uh, which may be the case. <laughs> But uh, I'll continue. And uh, if you want to write any questions in the chat or the Q&A function, I'll, I'll hope happily answer them after. So yeah, looking today at what we can learn to improve our responses in the future, particularly with a focus, a lens on how we can improve our response to protect the vulnerable. So the idea of not wasting this pandemic, uh, we've all paid a big price, and particularly in India. But what can we learn from what is perhaps the worst, worst health crisis in the history of post-independence India and for Australia for, you know, post-Second World War, this is, is definitely our worst health crisis. India's health system has been um, overwhelmed, as, as we've seen, and you don't need to be reminded of that. Australia's system, health system has been, has been tested and is now being tested. Uh, and we need to learn from places like India in how you responded to a massive demand for healthcare um, and also how you responded to 
keeping your health system open. Um, we can learn a lot from India, and I think you managed a number of patients that we can't imagine. Given our numbers in Australia, uh, we only have one oh, about 1,000 deaths and about um, 80,000 80, infections. So, you know, two days in India, you would have already eclipsed us in terms of numbers of infections and deaths. So we can learn a lot from India. Um, in terms of how we continue our current response to the pandemic, we can learn, but also to prepare for future pandemics and, and future uh, global health crises, which unfortunately will come our way. And we'll be ignorant to think that this is the only one for the next century. Particularly also, what can we learn about disability inclusive disaster risk reduction, which has been an exercise in that, I think, uh, and we haven't always performed well in Australia and perhaps India has struggled in that area as well. And particularly, how do we build back better in terms of our health system? How do we build back a better public health system that's more inclusive, that's able to be responding in um, a timely, ma timely manner to be able to um, respond not just to COVID and other infectious diseases, but to all, all public health challenges. And that's something that we've learned in Australia. Everyone knows what public health is now. Everyone knows what epidemiology is. Everyone knows what I do for a job as a public health physician. Whereas I think 18 months ago, I had to explain what my job was. So I think people are aware of what public health is and hopefully that will lead to changes. I'll just summarize quickly the Indian COVID data so I can compare it to Australia, but I think you know all this data off the you know, back of your hand. So obviously cases in India, um, 30, 34, 33 million have been recorded, but it's probably up to 30 times higher. The zero prevalence studies, again, 69%. The difference between Uttarakhand, where I work, and down the south in Kerala is significant, and that's probably to, this explains the current um, ways that we're seeing in India. And at least, but the, if you look at overall numbers, even at 69% zero prevalence, if, that's, if that is across the country taken as the average, it still leaves about 400 million people not protected, hence the need for the immunisation vaccination um, campaign. So the case is mostly happening in, in UP, um, which is, sorry, in Kerala, which is due to the fact that they have a very low zero prevalence, which reflects the situation in Australia and Victoria. Our zero prevalence is very low uh, because we had a very good public health response. Kerala's zero prevalence is quite low because they've had a good public health response, but it does mean you have to um, uh, face that reality at some point uh, where you're going to see an increase in cases and hopefully you face that reality when your vaccination rate is high, which is Australia's approach and which probably is Kerala's approach, I think. The numbers in places place like UP are very much unknown. 71% zero prevalence. Um, that doesn't equal 1.4 million cases that have been reported in UP. It's obviously uh, much, much, much higher than that. And likewise, with the official death rate, there's different estimates out there that you would have seen from India. The 4.4 lakh official death rate is probably eight to 10 times higher than that. Um, there are a number of different um, surveys and, and sources that you might have seen before, but basically showing between a, between a three and five million deaths is probably what the estimate, official the estimate would be in India um, if you had to do the modelling to include deaths that would have been missed. But all this to say that we need better large data health systems in a place like India and also in Australia to be able to closely monitor the progress so we can respond effectively, we can um, direct policy responses if we know the actual data. I think we didn't have a lot of really good data um, at times during the pandemic worldwide and in places like India and even Australia. Future waves, um, who knows what's going to happen in India, but I think they'll, the sea will be choppy for some time. There'll be some small waves coming and going depending where zero prevalence is still low and you know, what's going to happen in terms of future uh, variants and so on. But I think we're probably going to see a large wave in Australia, given that we have very low natural immunity from infection uh, and our vaccination rates are, are slowly climbing. So that's the data from Australia just to compare. Um, it's, it's quite a contrast, really, in terms of numbers. And so we've got very small numbers. I'm not sure if you can see the numbers there, but you can see that our um, overall and overall total cases is 52,000. Total deaths is about 1,000. Um, this is a few weeks ago, I think. So it's actually a bit higher now. And the active case is 18,000. So basically that's about one day in India to get to those level of cases, but we're a pretty small country. Um, and you can see also what's interesting is the age breakdown, which I'll come back to. The majority of our infections are in the young 
and nearly all the deaths um, in Australia have been in the elderly, the over 40s, uh, very few below 40 and no children in Australia have died uh, from COVID yet. There's a lot of testing in Australia, very high testing rates, as you can see there. Um, and I'll come back to the vaccination. That's the vaccination tally. Um, I was comparing it to the uh, medals in the Paralympics, which um, India did well, I, I saw in the Paralympics to get a couple of gold medals. Um, I've always liked the fact that India seems to prioritise its Paralympic uh, program. It's great, they, they do better in the Paralympic program than they do in the uh, Olympics. It's a good sign of a country that's focusing on equity and focusing on the marginalised. The immunisation uh, rates in India are uh, increasing slowly. Um, Australia is rapidly increasing currently, but we were very slow to start off with our immunisation campaign. In India, the, the rate overall rate might be low, but it's, it's clear from the second wave that the targeted immunisation of health care workers in India was highly effective. It, we, there was very few health workers who died who had been immunised doubly uh, in India, which was, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a relief because I think the system would have fallen over if you had had deaths and you know, lots of hospitalizations from healthcare workers who are infected. The places like CMC, um, you know, 11,000 staff vaccinated, they have one death amongst a staff member and that staff member had refused vaccination. So they had no deaths amongst um, vaccinated healthcare workers who've been doubly vaccinated. So that, that's, a, that's an incredible, incredible stat, um, and that's reflected across India. Of course, there was tragical, tragic circumstances where healthcare workers did die, but the number was very low due to very high vaccination rates and a targeted campaign of vaccination of healthcare workers. And that's what we have um, done in Australia as well. Um, but we aren't as quick in Australia to vaccinate our healthcare workers. Our rates aren't that high amongst our healthcare workers yet. So that's something we're trying to focus on in Australia. Singapore are doing really well in their vaccination campaign. I think Portugal's top right now, they're 80% with two-dose vaccination, um, but still seeing cases, and that's what we have to get used to in Australia, that you, at high levels of vaccination, we still are going to have a lot of infections, uh, mostly amongst the unvaccinated, and a lot of deaths as well, again, mostly amongst the unvaccinated. So the health impact of COVID has been severe, and that's what uh, Dr GVS touched on there, but the health impact and other, amongst other conditions has continued as well. But the health impact has been uh, disproportionately borne by the poor and those with disability, and often they coexist, disability and poverty, as a, um, a, yeah, a, a double, double disadvantage in the, in the face of COVID. Also comorbidities with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, respiratory disease also increased um, increased mortality, increased fatality from COVID. So it's, as, as many diseases, I think probably all diseases are, they discriminate uh, on the basis of disadvantage and COVID is no different, unfortunately. The overall infection fatality rate of COVID-19 is, is about you know, 0.23 to 0.25, which is, is lowish, but when you're seeing um, up to 60% of the world's population might be infected, that's obviously an unacceptably high amount of deaths that we would see. Um, it's much lower in low middle income countries, that fatality rate, uh, probably because it's lower in the younger. And a country like India is a young country compared to an old country like Australia. Uh, in, in Australia, most of the deaths have been above 75, uh, the average age of a COVID related deaths in the 70s. Whereas in India, the national life expectancy is around 68. So you're protected in a place with um, a low age demographic by the fact that the, the virus does discriminate against age, um, particularly if you're old. Your rate of, your chance of dying over 70 is, is many fold greater than um, the chance of dying at zero to 19. Which is why we're, we're struggling, and I know India is struggling as well, is to get children vaccinated for that 12 to 15, 12 to 19 age group. Because the death rate is so low, 0.003% of infections, uh, it's very hard to make a strong case that children should be vaccinated. They should be, and it's good for the public health and the community and their families and the country uh, and, and helpful for them as well, but it's not as clear cut as if you're a 70 year old. And that's speaking about the age divide in, in a place like India, we've written and done some research on this. Um, I mean, the elderly are protected naturally 
by not having nursing homes in a place like India, but also there's an additional burden they do have as well, um, which makes them disadvantaged in terms of multimorbidities, for example, um, and therefore very vulnerable to COVID. And that just shows you again, another figure, the, the chance of dying from COVID if you're over 85 is 630 times higher than if you're under 40. So massively more um, vulnerable to infections. The non-COVID health impacts, I think is what Dr. GBS was touching on. And right from the very start in, um, in April, March, April, there was a number of people writing around this and, and looking at the, you know, the consequences of disruption to the economy, at that point lockdowns as well, and disruption from COVID, the virus as well. Um, and I'll look at it a bit in terms of the non, non-health related um, outcomes, but also the non-COVID health related outcomes. This is looking at the non-COVID health related outcomes in India. We're looking at mortality since the pandemic began. You're looking, even now, COVID is number 11 in terms of causes of death. Uh, that, that's obviously underestimated, but as are a lot of the other um, diseases are underestimated in terms of their, their counts. But you can see that, you know, other, other, other causes of death which you are dealing with a PHFI in your other work is really, are really important uh, and can't be just neglected because the opportunity costs are focusing everything on COVID-19 is you miss out on the other 10 causes of death. This is Australia's uh, 10 lead, the causes of death, the leading causes of death since the pandemic began. And you see it's number 26 um, COVID right down there to make my graph very small to get Australia in. So in Australia, it hasn't been a significant cause of death. So even in Australia, we have to make sure we focus on other significant causes of death uh, and not neglect other causes um, in the face of the pandemic. And worldwide, that's the, that's the same worldwide, uh, in particularly particularly in the in the productive age group of thirty to sixty nine. Um, the main causes the main causes of death are not is not COVID. Five point five million from um, vascular causes, about one hundred thousand deaths a week in that age group. Uh, 4.2 million from cancer, that's about 80,000 deaths a week. Um, and same with NCDs and very much smaller numbers from communicable diseases and very small numbers from COVID. Um, in the above, in, in most of the COVID deaths are in that above 70 age group, but you're seeing 50,000 uh, deaths a week from COVID. So just getting in perspective is, is important. Otherwise, you end up with this sort of scenario where all our resources go into focusing on um, COVID. Uh, which is horrific. I know many people, including myself, have, have lost friends in India and family. Um, doesn't make it any less important, but we can't lose perspective and lose focus on other causes of disease that um, are resulting in morbidity and mortality. So the non-health system, the other sorry, the health system needs to also address the non-COVID health effects, and that's been a very a struggle for us in Australia, as it has been in India, when all the other services are disrupted. Um, the World Food Program estimates that a large increase in um, crop production and a large increase in people going hungry due to distribution chains and the disruption from the pandemic. We're, we're seeing that being played out now. Um, WHO, you know, TB diagnoses that have been missed, a large number of uh, diagnoses have been missed due to disruption. Plus, on the treatment side of TB, there's been a significant decrease in the treatment of TB. Uh, between 17 and 35% decrease, depending what sort of TB you look at. But worryingly, particularly against the multidrug resistant TB, a significant decrease around the 30, 35% decrease in treatment of multidrug resistant TB. So that's going to be, as uh, Dr. Evia suggested, a waves that we'll deal with in the future. So we're, we're now going to pay the price in you know, two or three years or in the coming years, as you see these other diseases um, increase in their numbers after having had Incre increasing control over those causes of death. The Lancet paper, likewise, increase in malaria uh, deaths up to half a million is expected. Risk of deferring consultations and surgery and treatment of other conditions. That's been the case in Australia, where especially in Melbourne, where we had a lockdown for four months. Um, got, when things went back to some sort of semblancy of norm, norm, normalcy in the health system, we had a huge wave of increasing consultations, increasing surgery. Uh, overwhelming the health system just from normal presentations. Uh, things have been had been delayed, and in some cases, when you delay a presentation too much, that leads to a bad outcome or a death. And that's one of these things: is prevent preventative health, um, dramatic drops in immunisation rates across the world and in screening rates. So, the TB, for example, 
but other other routine immunizations that save you know thousands of people measles is one that's increased dramatically in the last 18 months measles um kills about one in two thousand kids for example whereas COVID kills about one in twenty thousand kids that get it so much much more dangerous uh, infection to children but the immunization rates have dropped rapidly and there's been a lot of outbreaks across the world of measles the impact of fear isolation financial loss unemployment and mental health is clear and we've seen that um, in india and australia probably even more so i think there's been a bit of a mental health um, a huge mental health wave or tsunami of mental health conditions and I, I work in the emergency department as well and i see those coming in tomorrow morning i'm working in at eight o'clock in the morning i'll see those coming in, in the morning a lot of mental health related uh, presentations and of course 45 percent of people with disability report decrease in access to health care there's a great study by uh, your, yourself and your colleagues, um, Dr. GVS, that I've, I've quoted a few times, and uh, I really enjoyed reading about India's situation and how disability access was, was, has been affected. We, we did some research around the mental and social health effects of the pandemic, as I suggested in, in Australia, we have quite good data on this. There's not so much um, really clear data in India. We did a study in North India looking at um, why that's the case, and looking at the intersectionality in particular, looking at in particular looking at disability, people with disability, people who are poor, and seeing how they experienced um, COVID and how it led to mental health effects. And we saw a significant increase in levels of mental distress and mental ill health amongst people with disabilities um, during that time of um, of COVID last year. And that's something that I think is is reflected in other studies that have been done since. We also saw that there was quite a significant um, uh, resiliency that developed amongst the groups we were, we were researching. Um, the people were quite innovative in how they dealt with the isolation, with lack of access to services, to be able to get through those hard times. But we learned also disaggregated, disaggregated data is needed, particularly around disability. It's hard to get disaggregated data about uh, how COVID has affected people with disabilities, uh, both the health effects and the indirect effects on their access. So, I mean, the PHFI study, one of the, one of the few bigger reliable studies that I've seen in India, for example, particularly yeah, looking at how it affects people that have other disadvantages is really important. Otherwise, that gets lost in the, the huge numbers, uh, looking at the total population, the majority, rather than those minority who are affected. But I think what we've learned is the importance of the social determinants of health. It's, it's a very basic teaching, and that's something that's Public Health 101, your first lecture is on social determinants of health, and we've lost sight of that, I think, in the pandemic. Um, poverty, for example, closely correlates with mortality. We know that it's probably one of the closest um, associations um, with mortality is poverty levels. We've seen a lot of studies showing the increase um, levels of poverty, and that, that's expected to go on for years. We've seen basically a reversal of many years of development due to the downturn uh, as a result of COVID. Poverty in Australia hasn't been seen. We've delayed that by having resources um, to deal with that social determinants. So that hasn't been an issue in Australia. It's probably been more of an issue in certain populations in India. Education is a social, social determinant of health. We've seen that in Australia as well. India has had a, a tragic loss, I think, of up to 18 months of education for many children. Um, obviously, online service, online education is available. But this study, we've done, we just finished a study in India as well on the digital divide, and it's very large across the world. If you, and same in Australia, we're finding too. Um, if you have access to good technology and resources, online learning can be possible and can be done quite well. There's a lot of social um, interactions that you can't recreate, but the educational side you can replace. But that's not the case for more than a billion people, a billion children in the world who don't have access to that sort of level of resources. That's a lot of children missing out on education, and we're going to see wave after wave in the future, both economically and in health uh, terms as well as a social determinant of health. We know education correlates best with maternal infant mortality. That's the best indicator. And is the maternal mortality, sorry, maternal education levels, and that's going to have decreased in India, given a lot of, a lot of people won't go back to school. In, in Australia, um, we've done a lot of work in a research project recently published around those with disability getting access to education remote learning, it's been very difficult. Um, that's what your study showed at PHFI as well. 73% of people um, with disability have had severe disruption to education. The study we've done in Australia is similar. It's very difficult, especially for more severe disabilities, to get access um, to education. 
Uh, my, do- my daughter is, a, is an example of that. My daughter um, has a severe disability and she loves school and she really, she's at a specialist school. She thrives there. Online learning for my daughter does not work. Um, she doesn't sit in front of a screen. She's mobile. She uh, intellectually doesn't engage. It doesn't work. So a lot of kids with disability have just missed out entirely in the last 18 months. Um, and our, our family has, we have, have screens where we are a resource rich country. We've got, I counted my screens in my house. We've got nine screens, you know, two phones for each parent and a couple of laptops and a couple of iPads. We, we've got everything that you, you need to actually do education very well online. But even for us, it's been difficult. And that's, you know, repeated it across India where you have, we have that digital divide. Um, which we saw, we showed in our research is, is significant in accessing education. Unemployment, I won't go into, you know, the effect on unemployment has been significant in a place like Australia and in India. Um, and, yeah, I think that's that, that figure from your study at PHFI is showing 84% of people with disabilities had their livelihood disrupted. Um, it was probably high. I'm not sure what the comparator is in India. It was probably 50% of India, of India full stop had their, their employment disrupted. That's an important social determinant in the long term. One that we don't talk about much, um, and we, you know, if you know, it's hard to play it up or down, it's hard to measure, is the importance of freedom as a determinant of health. All of us have been limited in our freedoms over the last um, 18 months. And freedom, development as freedom, is a book that Amartya Sen uh, authored, a Nobel laureate who you know well, from your side of the world. Um, but that idea that freedom actually is a social determinant of health, democracy is a social determinant of health, your ability to do what you want to do is, is part of your you know, political liberties, is part of our well-being. Uh, we've lost that in Australia, um, and I think probably less so in India, actually. In Australia, we've been very authoritarian in enforcing our, our laws. Um, we've lost our, our right to go outside the house right now. We've been locked down in Melbourne the most of any city in the world. Um, so we've uh, spent more time in lockdown than any other country, any other city in the world. So we're getting used to it. Um, but it, it is not a, if you've seen Lord of the Rings and Gollum, you'll know what I mean. Um, you don't feel well after being locked inside for so long. It's not, <laughs> losing your freedom is not good for your health. And I think, you know, in Victoria, hopefully we'll get ours back. For places like China and Hong Kong, we don't know if the, that freedom will be returned. It, it, the encroachment on people's freedoms may be a long-term change. Um, yeah, we're facing that with vaccine compulsion and so is America. How much can you mandate vaccines or compel people to get vaccines or coerce them? Is that, is that good for people's health? Um, yeah, we've seen journalism and media silenced as well across the world um, and in Australia as well, in a lot of, which is good. You want to see fake news um, limited, obviously. So there's a health impact, but losing freedoms equally has a health impact as well. And that's very hard to measure, one that's not really talked about that much. Health system and COVID-19, what can we learn as a health system? I've sort of touched on this right through the talk, but just to summarise that, you know, we, our, the system worldwide has been laid bare and the vulnerabilities of every health system in the world have been laid bare and faced, you know, we faced exhausted health workforce, disruption of essential health services, inadequate access to preventative you know, PPE and other medical tools and vaccines. And that's been the case worldwide. Um, Oshman Bharat as a program um, in India, this is, you know, your, your flagship program, I guess, and the scale of it is, is amazing. And the, it probably, unfortunately, wasn't rolled out to, to an extent that was able to fully function and that it's still being rolled out in India. But it was, it was it, quite high levels of sign up to health insurance um, had already occurred. Um, and out of the out of the um, health and wellness centres, no, some were, a number were functioning. So a lot of testing and treatment for COVID um, for free was occurred in panel hospitals and, and public hospitals. But again, there were large disparities amongst um, states, which had different um, progressions in terms of their the rollout of the Ashman Bharat. Um, and also we saw other some groups were not able to access it, that same divide between rich and the poor. It continued in India like it does in other countries where um, in the absence of a comprehensive universal health care, those that can afford health care end up getting better access to COVID care or access to oxygen um, has become tragically um, apparent in India. And the idea of, you know, we also have the risk where large bills are run up by corporate hospitals. Um, we're doing a lot of, we're doing another study with the Gates Foundation around catastrophic health 
events and um, obviously COVID is a catastrophic health event and we're looking at the long-term impact on families over years of that catastrophic health event um, which we know that plays out it plays out over years not just over the, the the six months when you're unwell or the month when you're in hospital. So the health WHO health systems framework these are the areas we need to look at if we're going to um, improve our health system for, for the future to respond and I think I've touched on most of those. The health workforce, uh, in terms of disability health workforce, that's something we need to look at specifically. And India has had, made some very good moves recently to try and increase both the training of the health workforce through, of course, we've been involved in the community-based inclusive development um, program, which the government has recently rolled out. And that hopefully will provide a cadre of workers like Usher workers. Uh, initially, they've only, they've, um, they have uh, allotted funds for, a thousand of these workers, one of these, couple of each district, basically. But the idea of having uh, increased um, workforce that can respond to both health but also disability will be important. Um, and the other ones: financing, leadership and governance, access to essential medicines, um, and health information systems. We've already touched on those, I think. But you know, we're going to have to work on all of those um, each country uh, to be able to better prepare for future pandemics. And it does. It does look at also questions of public-private partnerships in healthcare. Uh, both, it, the approach is both and, you, need, you can't do without both of them. Uh, in Australia, we have a, a, um, a split system as well, where we have both public and private, as does India. Um, and there's a role for both to play. And I think we saw both public and private working closer together to respond to COVID in India, as we are in Australia. But we've also seen the importance of budgeting for public healthcare. Uh, because it is more effective at, at universal health care and providing access to people with limited access to resources to afford to pay. And the importance of investing in that public health system is going to be important um, to increase access to care for those who are vulnerable, for those with disability, for the poor, and other intersectional disadvantage. Um, Lincoln NGOs and see, you know, community based organisations and private partnerships, they've, they've been good. In India, that and and that at times they've been problematic, um, but you know we've seen relief and care given out initially for quarantined returning workers, re a huge response across India, which was you know warming, was heartwarming, uh, given the scale of the issue that evolved last year in, in April May. Uh, NGO partners that were called on in, to become COVID treatment centres and private hospitals, charity hospitals. It was a it was a an all India response, and that was great to see India come together. Um, and I think we've learned also that NGOs and CBOs often have uh, excellent access to communities to be able to provide services and healthcare. And same in disability, there was a number of pop-up type responses to try and access, um, provide support to people with disabilities who maybe would have been left out from just the basic access to COVID care. Um, and that that one is an example that the one the grassroots volunteer group was set up. Other examples exist across India, and there was a you know, significant number of these um, groups, community-based groups, um, really popped up to try and respond to the massive need. And the risk also, obviously, of, of um, linking with private providers is that that profiteering um, that's always going to occur um, and was obviously ripe to be exploited during the pandemic second wave because of the massive need and massive demand for health services. I think in the future, we need to capitalise on digital um, health or virtual health, as we would call it in Australia. It's beyond just telehealth. Telehealth is one element of virtual health, but I mean, virtual health care is the future. In a place like India, which you have a well endowed with te technical expertise and um, IT experts, you run our IT systems across the world, probably in Australia and the, and the US as well. Uh, you, you're well placed to be able to capitalise on the potential of digital health and telehealth and virtual health. Uh, and a lot of a lot of larger corporates have moved into that space in India as well, seeing the huge market for that in the future. And solve care is is one example of that. But we we um likewise I'm sure you did we we set up um, some services for our programs in North India to provide basic advice during COVID. Um, yeah, one of my staff members basically was managed his whole condition and very serious condition like an ICU almost at home. Um, and that happened right across the country. And I think it's, you know, tele telehealth now have been accepted as normal in Victoria. Since I said, we've been locked down more than any other state 
in the world, we're used to doing um, remote care now, whether that be doctor's appointments or my, my wife's dermatologist, it's all done remotely. Apart from working in emergency, I'm still face-to-face, -face, obviously. But a lot, of, a lot of healthcare is now done remotely and that will remain so in Australia and I, I suggest also in India, which can be a good thing. It, it, it can be a good thing because it does provide potentially better access to healthcare, particularly where you may have a low doctor to patient ratio. You can overcome that partly by providing, particularly in rural areas, by providing telehealth services. But then there's a need for regulation and quality control, um, which is very difficult when you've got a rapid scale-up. There's also a need for equity focus, and we've been um, aware of that as we're doing some, we applied for some further research funding, Australia and India research uh, funding, to look at the case in Australia and India. We should be able to increase disability access or access to people in rural areas, which Australia and India both have significant rural populations. Um, but actually, sometimes we're seeing decreased access because people in those areas have less access to technology. And like we all know, the internet comes in and out all the time and your data allowance is not great and you haven't got 5G or 3G even um, in some areas of Australia and in India. So there's a whole lot of, you can actually see that it may increase um, inequity rather than actually address it. So that, that's an important area to consider. And particularly for people with disabilities, how can they access technology? How can we make technology um, disability accessible uh, is a really important question to answer. Um, I'll, I think we've also learned the you know, use of simple technologies as well is really important. And social media um, is a virtue and a curse and given the false information that it can spread, but it can be really effective to get information out quickly. Um, proper public health you know, information, it's a really good way to disseminate information quickly. And the idea of you know, relying on phone or, or relying on not high level virtual healthcare if, if the technology doesn't allow that or the access in rural or remote or amongst uh, poorer communities doesn't allow that, there is alternatives to explore. Um, I think I've touched on most of that. I won't go into it in general, but just to say that, again, we've learned the value, I think, in community, develop, community development of navigation by judgment, where we allow people on the front line to make judgments because they're often the best, they are the best place. Nothing about, nothing about us without us. They are the best place to make a lot of decisions around um, care and provision of care in a safe way. And obviously we've relied on Zoom and I'm here tonight on Zoom. So we've been very dependent on, um, on those uh, use of ICT to provide services. And I think just from a basic community health, primary healthcare lens, We've, we've learned uh, the importance, I said, of, of looking locally, strength-based approach. Um, also looking holistically at people's mental health and well-being, not just on one disease. Um, we learned the importance of not abandoning other programs, if at all possible. Um, and that primary health care level often provides a lot of the preventative, promote health, promotive care in communities. Um, and I think I've touched on, I've already made it very clear, the importance of not um, not excluding people with disability, the poor, the marginalised, disadvantaged. That, that community health, that's a or public public health. That should be our prim primary focus of us in public health and our health system. And our public health system has to focus on these um, vulnerable groups. So I think we need primary health and community health more than ever during the pandemic. Would be my conclusion. So thank you. I would love to answer any of your questions. I know there's experts in the room and share your insights as well. Um, I'm sure I haven't done justice to some of the um, areas that we've discussed, but thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Nathan, uh, for your uh, very good and elaborate speech. Thank you, thank you very much for the for, for, for the same. Uh, Rajan, any questions raised so far? Um. So I don't see any questions raised, but yes. I see uh, Nanda has his hand up. Yeah, Nando has his hand up. So Nando can. Hi, Nathan. Good to see you. See you again, Nanda. Yeah. Thanks for your wonderful lecture. I enjoyed listening to it. A couple of quick questions in terms of uh, the impact of uh, COVID on the Australian Aborigines, how the most vulnerable and marginalized society in Australian society were you know, disproportionately affected or not. And the second question was around uh, the vaccines you said, you know, because it looks like there is a hesitancy of uh, around taking vaccines in there and how 
the Australian health system and government is planning to deal with this vaccine hesitancy. Thank you. Well, they're, they're, they're great questions, Nanda. If you have the solutions, then please let us know um, because that was the, <laughs> it's a million dollar question. Uh, we, in terms of vaccines particularly, we, we've had difficulty in accessing vulnerable groups, particularly those in poorer areas of Melbourne and Sydney, particularly um, new immigrant, immigrant communities who may not speak English. Uh, we haven't done our cross-cultural communication very well. I would say we haven't done, we haven't done Community Development 101 very well which is, you know, how do you make your message accessible to all parts of the community? How do you go in there in person and meet with the spiritual leaders or meet with the local community leaders? We, we seem to have failed, and that's where we failed in controlling the virus, which means that those populations have been more highly affected by the virus and infected and had out, bad outcomes because we haven't been able to provide, haven't, haven't known or haven't, haven't learned in public health over hundreds of years, we should have learned how to engage marginalised or um, low-income communities or culturally and linguistically diverse communities. Um, people with disabilities, likewise, have been lost to access to carers um, because there are very strict rules. You couldn't have in-home care uh, for, your, for persons with disabilities, which made basic care provision um, even harder to get. And there's been a number of bad outcomes from that, and that's been the case right across the world, I think. Um, rural, again, it's been very difficult to get access um, to rural communities, but we've been lucky that most of our infections have been highly focused, well, not lucky, but they've been much more uh, focused in the bigger cities. So we haven't seen a lot of um, outbreaks in rural areas, but rural people have, have suffered from lack of access to healthcare in general, and the shutting down of the city systems and a lot of our rural Communities rely on health services in the cities and they haven't been able to access those. The vaccine rollout is a similar, similar issues that we're facing. It's, it's um, much higher hesitancy amongst uh, vulnerable groups and particularly groups that may not be able to access um, resources in their own language or their own cultural. Um, not just a, it isn't just a language thing, it's a, it's a cultural communication too. So I'm sure India could teach us much more about, you know, it, it, we haven't done it very well. How do you get vaccination information out there? How do you fight? How do you fight false fake news in those populations, don't get their information from the government or maybe don't even trust the government or refugee populations and not, not, um, have had bad experiences trusting government before and they don't trust the government information that's put out there. So they look to alternative resources, alternative sources, and we haven't been able to use those alternative sources, which are often you know, leaders from their local community. For example, we haven't been able to engage well so our vaccination rates are lower in our most vulnerable groups where the infections are the highest. So that's a bad combination, obviously. I'm not sure it's the same in India, I'm not sure. Um, ways to overcome that, uh, it, it's, it's really hard. Australia is looking at mandating vaccines in certain places. I think we will see more of that. Um, it's, a, it's an equity issue, particularly with disability. And that's where it's really hard to make a case for because if you mandate vaccines to go to any event, whether that be cultural or going to dinner or accessing school or education, if you're not vaccinated, if you aren't vaccinated, you can't get access or you can't teach in those or you can't work. There's a certain group of people um, due to health conditions and due to disabilities who can't get vaccinated. So you end up excluding those people who are already vulnerable. Um, I must say it's only a very, very small number uh, who can't have, is a medical, have medical reasons not to get vaccinated. There's very few medical conditions that are contraindications. On the contrary, most severe medical conditions actually make you a priority group for vaccination because you're much more vulnerable. I'm sure you've had, like I've had, friends in India who died um, because people told them you're sick, you've got a heart condition, you shouldn't get vaccinated, you're already too vulnerable. I, I yeah, I, I think that's such a, it makes me upset that that's been promoted. It's, it's the opposite. People who have conditions like heart conditions or disabilities usually need to get access to vaccinations as a priority because they're more vulnerable. There's very few medical reasons why you can't, but there is some, which does mean those people will be discriminated against if you have vaccination passports, which we will in Australia. It may be too difficult in India to actually enforce that, but Australia has the resources to enforce that and it'll be a very divisive, um, divisive approach, but it will be effective. And we're seeing a lot of demand for vaccinations now that We've started to announce these this weekend. We're opening up 
some little bit to have outdoor gatherings of five people if you're vaccinated in Victoria. If you're not vaccinated, you've got to stay at home. So there's an incentive will be, it'll increase the demand, has already increased the demand for vaccinations. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks, thanks, thanks Dr. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Anna, so, we're just Yeah. Yeah, we have, uh, we have Shailaja who has raised her hand and then I will ask a question. Shailaja, you can go first. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to see where my I'd video is. I'd love to see is. your face, uh, uh, you, you might not have your video because I think you... Okay. Yeah, anyway, you go ahead and ask your question. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, hi, uh, Nathan. Thank you so much for that um, wonderful talk. Uh, I just had a question on the disaster risk reduction uh, that you mentioned, and I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on uh, the measures that were uh, undertaken in Australia towards uh, disaster risk reduction. Thank you. Yeah, if you disability inclusive disaster risk reduction you're referring to, or just in general? Yes. Yeah, we, we've all practiced this in Australia and in India, you know, disability inclusive disaster risk reduction. We've had programs in Uttarakhand that we've run um, to prepare people for a disaster, which we thought would be another earthquake in Uttarakhand or a flood or the usual culprits. Um, yeah, but it's the same principles that you use. Uh, and we had a state of disaster declared in Victoria when we had a second wave of cases. Um, disability inclusion, I, I can't say that there were any great learnings, Shalaja, that we would share about best best practice. Um, there was some targeted programs to provide food and uh, basic medical care for people who had who were disability who were disabled and couldn't get access to those those care. So medically, I think there was quite a good program to provide for their medical needs um, and ways that did it using remote technology and using the, you know public health resources. Uh, there wasn't, though, in terms of access to services like disability care. Um, it took a lot of community community op community um, out outcry and advocacy to make sure that people with disabilities could access as a priority, could access basic um, personal care, like personal care is coming to the home, and that did change um, early on to loosen restrictions for people with disability. So now, in this in this current um, lockdown if you have a disability you get a lot more space than you would if you didn't have a disability so there's been a prioritization of that of that group in terms of space meaning you can have carers come into your home now um, my, my daughter abby is back at school even though other schools are closed because they realize that these uh, the kids can't a lot of kids with disability can't easily learn, learn at home um, and there's yeah so there's, there's a lot more programs that we've learned as, as we've gone i think and that's the problem with a lot of these you know, disability inclusive disaster risk reduction programs, you can, only, you can only prepare so much. When it comes down to it, it's you often learn on the job. And we've learned on the job, I think, in Australia how to protect those communities. Um, and maybe I'm not sure what the case was in India, but yeah, I, I did feel even in our programs in North India, a lot of the principles that we've learned we were able to use, but didn't make it any easier in the face of such a massive disaster. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Shalajaji. Good to hear from you. Uh, thank you, Nathan. I think there is a question in chat box. It's more of sure. a comment from Pragya Singh. As per the growing evidence across the globe of children being less often affected due to pandemic, but what about the vulnerable groups among these children who are struggling with comorbidities such as malignancies, immunocompromised state? Because we are sending a wrong signal which might not uniformly apply to all children. I think that's what uh, Pragya Singh is uh, trying yeah. to raise. No, yeah. Thank you, Pragya. Uh, appreciate that question. There's two sides to that. Uh, one is that uh, vulnerable kids um, who have like malignancies, like you suggested, yes, are more likely to die from COVID. So saying that kids are, are basically not, not in danger of COVID is a generalisation. That's, again, we risk um, betraying marginalised or vulnerable groups in those situations. Um, and the deaths that happened in America and the UK, it's a one in, one in 20,000 kids who gets COVID dies from it. But we're also seeing that the majority of those kids that died did have a disability, uh, a multimorbidity or a, a malignancy. 
So that's both one side. I think yes. The other side of it is um, is vaccination again. Um, we had our expert advisory committee group meeting yesterday in Australia with the government, um, the head health officers, and just reinforcing this again that amongst those kids that have malignancies or have comorbidities, they they are a priority group to get vaccinated. They're safe to get vaccinated. They actually need um, a, probably a booster shot earlier than other than other people would need. Um, because they don't respond as well in their initial response, antibody response. But nearly every, there's very, very few conditions that are not safe to get vaccinated, and those kids need to be vaccinated as a priority. I'm not sure where India is at in terms of that, but that's our focus in Australia, that younger kids, and we're, we're only registered up until, sorry, we're only allowed to vaccinate over 12s in Australia. That's the registration under the Therapeutic Goods Association. Uh, but everyone between 12 and 18 now has a malignancy, they're a priority to get vaccinated very quickly to protect to protect them. The, the issue we're facing in Australia around vaccination and child, uh, children is that because children um, have such low rates of fatality, it's very hard to get uptake of um, vaccination amongst kids. And that's going to be an ongoing issue, um, yeah, because kids do have, overall, have low rates of um, mortality. So I'm writing some articles in the media currently on this because I think it is still important to vaccinate kids, um, as I said before, um, even just as far as their, their sort of long COVID, which is about 7% in teenage kids. So that's a significant impact as well. And plus, you know, 1 in 20,000 is still, still a much higher fatality rate from that than the vaccination, um, which so far, unless you've heard of anything differently, there hasn't been one child who's died from vaccination yet. So, so far, so good. But as soon as we have a couple of kids that do die from vaccination, it'll make it very difficult um, to get public acceptance of vaccination of kids. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Um, I will have the privilege of asking the last question. Um, it's more of a, uh, more of a comment also. Um, if you look at the way governments have responded, um, we know in the pandemic, public health social measures play a very important role. And to get public health social measures in place appropriately based on the burden, whether health systems are affected, not affected, you need community engagement. And in your opinion, how good was that community engagement in Australia? Because you said about vaccine, it didn't happen the way it should have happened. Yeah. And that's why there is a lot of vaccine hesitancy. But even in managing the pandemic, you needed community engagement more than the overriding thing was fear and then the authoritarian lockdowns in some countries and some countries going just the other way around and saying, no, we will not do anything and let the pandemic run its course. And then they later on came down to lockdown. I mean, but mm. the established principles were not really practiced um, anywhere, uh, except yeah, I think no. Singapore and some countries, some smaller countries. Yeah. yeah. No, exactly, Dr. Rajan. And I think it was difficult, particularly in very diverse countries with diverse communities, because each one of those communities needs a, potentially needs a different approach to community engagement. And I think it's, we didn't realise that in this, well, we, we knew it in Australia, but it's very, you have got to be very careful um, by focusing on, on one particular group, you can end up promoting racism or stigmatisation of that group. So behind the scenes, it was happening more so. But in the public eye, there was not much evidence of that engagement with um, different diverse groups. But I think the community, what we had in, in Victoria was a fear-based fear -based approach initially. And that, that yeah. did make people fall into line a little bit and an authoritarian-based approach. Um, so we had a, what we saw was probably a social, a social compact or seeing a lot of unity amongst the society in a place like Victoria where they're, on the whole, people have obeyed tight restrictions um, very well. And we had high levels of um, compliance with public health measures, which is why we were able to stamp out COVID last year. Obviously, we... We've, this time we're not going to be able to stamp it out. But last year we could pre-Delta because we had very good compliance amongst the community. Um, yeah, I, but not, not all groups. And where the outbreaks happened last year were in the diverse groups. We didn't have such good engagement necessarily. The, the resources we had available did allow us to engage with 
the community and I guess support communities that required um, employment. Because I mean, if you if you're basic, which is what happened in India, you know, if you need if you're more likely to die from not being able to feed yourself, then you're not going to obey COVID restrictions. It, you know, COVID is not the threat; starvation is the threat. Um, in Australia, we've been able to people that couldn't work because of COVID, we've subsidised them, we've given support to them financially. So, you know, if you couldn't work because of COVID, you got payments. That hasn't been possible in bigger countries or low middle income countries. Um, so there's been support from the government programs to actually encourage people to get on with the um, the process of, of containing uh, and obey, you know, I guess enforcing and obeying and seeing public health measures rolled out and effective. Um, it was both community engagement, but also large resource investment, I think, that enabled it to happen. But I, I think it's, it's it's Public Health 101, Dr. Rajan, and your students on the call will be aware of that. That's something you teach. And we've learned the importance of teaching that well, but also doing it well. I think we've given it far too much lip service in the past in Public Health 101, but we don't actually go into the details of how to do it really, really well. And we're paying a price worldwide for that. And I fully agree with you. The cost uh, the world has paid because of COVID-19 pandemic. We should not let it go. We should learn some lessons, at least in future. Uh, because I'll give you an example in India, the moment uh, the lockdown were uh, opened up, um, people started moving out, COVID appropriate behavior went for a toss. Yep. Yeah. So if there had been focus on community engagement and the, the, the duration of lockdown could have been reduced significantly, mm -hmm and more focus on COVID appropriate behavior. Yep, yep. But, uh, I, and you know what happened after that with people mm -hmm. dying of hunger and economic issues becoming more important. So I felt that lesson, in, uh, India was one of the countries, there were a lot of other countries which went through a similar uh, situation. Um, yeah, I think I think so, Dr. Rajan. It, it, it is difficult, isn't it, for us? It's easy in hindsight to know and some of us were saying similar things to what you're saying now, you know, 12 months ago, but it's really difficult without hindsight to know what's right and wrong yes. in, in such an unprecedented pandemic and the scale of it and the disruption. It's something we, it's hard to plan for something that's totally unknown and it hasn't happened before in, in modern history, really. So it's, it's, it's a really difficult balance to get, isn't it? And we so, we let, so, so we let actually fear overtake our decisions. Mm. Uh, I, I think that is what happened. The rationality somewhere got uh, lost. Anyway, um, uh, thank you. Dr. Jairam, over to you. I think we don't have any more questions and we are closing. So, yeah. Ultimately, thank you very much, Mr. Nadan, for uh, all the help you're doing for the your lecture is really very good. And the questions raised by the participants are also very, very, very good and encouraging and interesting. So the on behalf of the IAPH and PHFI, once again, I, I, I thank you, Nathan, for all the, for, for, for this uh, great mm -hmm. lecture. Right. Thank and you, Dr. Goodness, sir. Jeremy, in, in, thank you. Thank right. you also for having me. I, I really enjoyed this time together and I look forward okay, to visiting okay. face to face with you all we'll again. We look forward to your cooperation, Nathan, in future also. Right, right. right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Rajan. Thank you, Nandu. Thank you, Selija. Thank you all. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nathan. Bye. Bye.